Good morning, and welcome to the First Unitarian Church. I'm so glad that we have a chance to come together after such a, a difficult week, in fact, a very painful week. We grieve not only for the, the loss of life suffered in Las Vegas last Sunday night, and the nearly 500 innocent people who were injured at that time, we grieve today because we have, we have lost our nerve as a nation to, to stand up to gun lobbyists and act as a civilized society that will not tolerate such easy access to deadly weapons. After Columbine, there was no, no talk of gun control legislation. After Isla Vista, there was nothing. After Aurora, there was nothing. After Virginia Tech, there was nothing. After Sandy Hook, there was nothing. After Gabby Giffords was shot in Tucson, there was nothing. And after Steve Scalise was shot in Washington, there was nothing. And now, after Las Vegas, there was an effort not to politicize the matter, as though political allegiance to gun money has no bearing on a culture that routinely produces mass murder. Our Congress has even eliminated all funding to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention in its efforts to research, just research, the relationship between gun violence and public health. We grieve and we are angry. Common sense, moral rectitude, and courage have been sacrificed on the altar of personal greed. Our nation's leadership doesn't lead. Our nation's people fail to organize. The Second Amendment is merely a smokescreen, a sad real rationalization for those who live their lives in fear and who have been made paranoid by their own prejudices. And now we come together as a congregation we come here this morning to share our grief and our anger and our hope in the infinite possibilities of love. Symbol of light and of knowledge symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. May we open our service, turning our hymn books, please, to number 170.
there's a spiritual that our choir will sing this morning that contains this haunting reminder. Can't no one know at sunrise how this day is going to end? It addresses, of course, our vulnerability as people and our inability to discern the, the unexpected things that life throws at us randomly with no, no real purpose or intent. Now, following the, the tragedy in Las Vegas last Sunday, when none of us could possibly have had an inkling of how that day would end. We can definitely relate to the poet Adrian Rich who wrote, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age with no extraordinary power reconstitute the world. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. Let us find that place in our hearts this morning, moved by all we cannot save. O mysterious spirit of life and death and source of all love, when our questions challenge a troubling and troubled world, may courage remain with us. When the mysteries, the pain of paradox and sorrow are felt in our souls, May deep awareness and sensitivity guide us and strengthen us. May the love of truth comfort us and lead us. May honesty of thought and deed unite in us. And thus may the spirit of life renew us and help us to reconstitute this world. Amen.
morning. The reading this morning is from the poet and philosopher David White, who believes in the power of a beautiful question amidst the drama of life. This reading is about how our lives shrink or expand in proportion to our courage to be vulnerable in difficult times. Inhabiting Vulnerability by David White. Vulnerability is not a weakness, a passing inconvenience, or something we can arrange to do without. Vulnerability is not a choice. Vulnerability is the underlying, ever-present, and abiding undercurrent of our natural state. To run from vulnerability is to run from the essence of our nature. To run from vulnerability is to run from the essence of our nature. The attempt to be invulnerable is the vain attempt to become something we are not. And most especially, to close off our understanding of the grief of others. More seriously, in refusing our vulnerability, we refuse the help needed at every turn of our existence and immobilize the essential, title, and conversational foundations of our identity. The only choice we have as we mature is how we inhabit our vulnerability, how we become larger, more courageous, and more compassionate through our intimacy and disappearance. Our choice is to inhabit vulnerability as generous citizens of loss, robust and fully, or conversely as misers and complainers, reluctant and fearful, as always at the gates of existence, but never bravely and completely attempting to enter, never wanting to risk ourselves, never walking fully through the door. Never walking fully through the door. It really is a joy to welcome everyone here this morning and a particular warm welcome to those who are 
here for the first time or relatively new to our church. We hope that this is a place that you can grow comfortably uh, with, um, with great ease and hopefully little time. In our program, you'll notice a lot of announcements, and some of them are actually tailor-made for those who are kind of looking around church shopping, we call it in the trade, shopping for um, a, a possible community in which they, uh, which they want to join. And so we've got, starting on Wednesday, a curricular called Building Your Own Theology. It is open to everybody, but I would urge that those who are more on the newish side, be sure to sign up at our Congregational Life Table. This is a fabulous program. It's gonna be facilitated by our Assistant Minister, Monica Dobbins, and it's, um, it's absolutely, absolutely splendid. A week from tomorrow, Monica and I will be facilitating a UU orientation class. And this is a two hour um, hard push and drive for everyone to come to some understanding of Unitarian Universalist theology, Unitarian Universalist history, a better understanding of the history of this church. And again, if you're just in that exploratory stage, make a note a week from tomorrow at seven o'clock in our main social hall, Elliott Hall, please be present and with us. And for those of you who have been around a while, I'm going to be facilitating a aging and spirituality class. It's going to run for three successive Monday nights starting October 30th. Please sign up at the Congregational Life Table. And the caveat is you're going to have to buy a book which costs $12, and that's really going to be the resource that we're going to be using through those three weeks. Please note that this aging and spirituality workshop is being held in the afternoon from 1 to 2.30. I believe the first time ever that we're holding something in the afternoon. The reason being that for those who prefer not to drive at night, you've got an opportunity to come in the afternoon and explore aging and spirituality. Um, if you are inclined not to believe in aging, then don't sign up for this workshop. <laughs> If you feel it's, uh, you know, you may want to, you may want to take a look. Please be so kind as to read all of the, uh, all of the announcements because they really, they offer a, a glimpse of uh, what this church is all about. One of our highlights of the year, of course, is the church auction. It is a, a, a tremendous amount of fun, and it is also. Uh, so significant in terms of a stream of income to help us keep keep going as a church community. Our, our auctioneer is going to be Jim DeBacchus, who is essentially our voice. <laughs> Just the name Jim DeBacchus sparks a couple of laughs. He, he is our voice of the legislature, probably the only voice that we have, and it'll be good to, to meet with him as he uh, makes his way through as an auctioneer. And the recipient of our Fairly Free Thinker Award will be Kate Kelly, who really is a dynamo in her own right and I know will draw a lot of people to hear her speak. So it's going to be a, um, an absolutely fabulous auction on November 4th. Tickets are on sale now. Please find your way to the table at, in, during coffee hour. And uh, the prices are, ticket prices, sing, excuse me, uh, $60.00 for a ticket, which includes dinner and uh, just meeting with those wonderful celebrities. And if you are in a position where $60 represents quite a stretch, please see me privately and confidenti confidentially and we will, we will work it out. Our goal is to have everyone in our church community present at the auction, so see me if uh, we can be of any help. The offering will now gratefully be received, a chance to greet one another and to bid each other a wonderful day.
there's a great story about Suzuki Roshi, who founded the San Francisco Zen Center in 1959. And many of us may not be, be aware that that was the first Zen Center established anywhere in the world outside of Asia. And Suzuki Roshi was one of the premier master teachers, perhaps the master teacher of, of all times. But the story, the story pertains to him teaching a Zen class in San Francisco when one of his students, overwhelmed by all this, all these, all this wisdom that was coming at him, and he assumed uh, all the other students in the class, interrupted Suzuki Roshi very apologetically and humbly confessed that all the students were simply learning too much stuff. Th their minds couldn't handle all this new information that was coming in. He then said, would, would Suzuki Roshi be so kind as to distill all his teachings into one thing so they can finally get their minds around what he's been talking about. You know, just, to, just give us one thing to hang on to. What a request. What a challenge to lay out the one thing all students of Zen need to know. <clears throat> well, what followed was the classic uh, pregnant pause, great anticipation just electrified the air. And finally, Suzuki Roshi spoke two words. Everything changes. That's all we need to know. Everything changes. As simple as that sounds, don't be fooled. It's hard to get our minds around that. You know, so much of our suffering is due to the desire, if not the, the expectation that our health, prosperity, love will remain with us as is forever. Now in our reading this morning from David White, his message was that we are all vulnerable at the very core of our existence. Vulnerability, in fact, defines our humanity. <laughs> we pretend otherwise. Everything changes. Our loved ones die. We get divorced. We miss the bottom step of a staircase. We get laid off our job. A promising college quarterback gets tackled from behind and is out for a season or even more. In fact, I, I had counseled one such young man about 10 years ago, a, a quarterback from Oklahoma State. That was pretty intense. There we were, huge injury that totally shifted his life. Yeah. Everything changes. Everything changes. It's a teaching that we're not prepared to accept in spite of it being the one teaching we need to grasp probably more than, than any other. A biologist from the University of Utah who specializes in trees and spends a lot of her time working with students about 100 feet up in the air studying the canopy of trees, had a safety cable snap and she fell to the ground and shattered her body. A son or daughter goes off to a country music concert in Las Vegas. A member of our church fell asleep behind the wheel, crashing into an oncoming car. A lump is diagnosed as malignant. We need only examine our own lives to, to understand the meaning. Yeah, everything changes. Permanency is an illusion. And yet, what is it that we crave? Permanency. 
And that was surely the case for Sheryl Sandberg, who thought she had carved out the perfect life forever and ever. Change was never on her radar. My God, a few years ago, she was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Sandberg is COO of Facebook, was the first woman to serve on Facebook's Board of Trustees. And before that, she was vice president of global online sales and operations at Google. And before that, she was chief of staff for Lawrence Sumner when he was the US Secretary of the Treasury. Sandberg really stirred the feminist pot with her best-selling publication in 2013 called Lean In. Life is good. Life is good for Cheryl. She married a guy named Dave Goldberg, and in their storied lives, he sold his business in LA to Yahoo, moved to San Francisco because they wanted to end their commuter marriage, stay together so they can start a family. And once in San Francisco, he took over the company that runs SurveyMonkey. After having two beautiful children, a boy and a girl, Dave was found unconscious on the floor next to an elliptical machine where he was working out at a hotel gym. He died at age 47. His now widow, Sheryl Sandberg, wrote, and so began the rest of my life. It was and still is a life I never would have chosen, a life I was completely unprepared for. It was unimaginable. You know, nobody can prepare for tragic events. I mean, you, you simply cannot live your life that way. And I suspect that even Suzuki Roshi would, would say pretty much the same thing. Should we come to accept suffering as a part of life, the anticipation of it, even if it is inevitable, will only inhibit living a productive life, living the way we really should conduct our lives. Let's face it, we're always going to be unprepared which is not necessarily a bad thing. Even Zen masters can be unprepared, can be caught off guard, suffer loss, and grieve deeply. Now, some of you know Genpo Roshi when he was the Zen master at the Kanzion Center just up the street here on South Temple. I was with him the day after his dog died. And we spent a lot of time doing grief work and dealing with his guilt for letting his dog out of the car wash just when another car was approaching to use the vacuum cleaner. Oh my God, how could I? Absolutely riddled with grief and guilt. Offering comfort to a Zen master is a unique experience. I, I can assure you that. <laughs> he knows about impermanence. He knows. I mean, that, that's his teaching. And yet losing his dog was unimaginable to him at that time. So wh whether we are a, a Zen master or COO of Facebook, or studying the canopy of trees, or a promising quarterback, or just a regular, unglamorous person. Everybody faces adversity. No one is exempt. And it happens so quickly. We are so unprepared. Our mindset is dialed into permanence. This is, this is my life. This is, this is the life I lead. You know, I, I think it's really pretty good. You know, I've got, and there, there are you know, millions of variables. I got, I got my spouse, I got my children, got my job, I got my friends, 
I got my, my house, I got my routines, I got my, keeps going, I got my happiness. And so when life changes, wow, we are then changed. Following her husband's unimaginable death, the high-flying Sheryl Sandberg wrote a new book called Option B. It falls somewhere between a self-help book and an exercise in humility. Now, it offers too many quick remedies for, for my taste, but she's only trying to help others who are suddenly submerged, submerged in the unthinkable. But she did mention kind of a, a universal truth. She mentioned something that is a of great value, a, a characteristic of what a person feels when his or her world falls apart. And that is that we are prone to believe that the aftershocks, the grief, the fallout will last a lifetime. We simply cannot imagine a new life following devastation. Life crashes down on us. Life is broken. Too many, too many pieces to put back together. And we figure, well, this now is how it will be. But what it really, what it really all comes down to is that our single biggest hope for resuming life in a positive way, the biggest variable inside us all is something called resilience. And what is so astounding is that despite our vulnerability, despite unimaginable changes to what we believed would be our life script forever, we are blessed with a gift of bouncing back. It comes from somewhere deep within us. And sometimes it takes a long while. Some people are more resilient than others. But at some point, when we are pulled under, we kick against the bottom and rise up again to break the surface. The poet Donald Babcock says that we may be well aware of how much we have weathered in life, but we wonder what is in store for the future. And you'd be right to wonder, he says. There is much in store for the future, yours and everyone else's. But he says, we're a lot like ducks riding on the heaving Atlantic Ocean. And while we can smooth our feathers to keep them in top condition and peer at the sky to discern changes in the weather, mostly we ride the waves, which we only partially understand. But my concern this morning is coming to terms with what happens when we are ultimately upended on our ocean ride. How do we get back on to the wave? Basically, how much, how much resilience do we have? Now, scientists who study stress and resilience say it's important to think of resilience as an emotional muscle that can be strengthened at any time. And so when a crisis hits, we need to be concerned with our emotional recovery. And I feel, I feel it's really helpful to hear scientists discuss resilience as life's greatest challenge. Life's greatest challenge getting back onto that wave, life's greatest challenge. Can you imagine being a resilience researcher 
like Dennis Charney, Dean of the School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, who went after, after leaving a deli where he picked up his lunch, he got shot by a disgruntled former employee of the deli. Dr. Charney spent five days in intensive care and then became a subject of his own research. And facing the challenge to recover not only physically, but emotionally. After 25 years of studying resilience, all eyes were now on Dr. Charney to determine his resilience, which boils down to the capacity to move forward in life once you've been traumatized. Now, for many years, I, like most people in the helping professions, have been a student of helping others move forward in life after experiencing the unthinkable. Helping people move forward after, after life suddenly changes and they're almost virtually paralyzed in their, in their grief and suffering. The big picture is moving people from I will never recover from this to this is going to be different to I think I need to rethink my life goals. We all have an important part to play in this process. You know, it's not something to be left solely to therapists, grief counselors, clergy, social workers, and the like. And we all have family members, dear friends, who've experienced trauma and are struggling, struggling to be resilient, that is, resilient enough to reframe the narrative of their lives so that they will be able once again, in the words of Sheryl Sandberg, so they can be able once again to take back joy. moving someone along so they could take back joy. Resilience is an interesting term. It initially derived its meaning in metallurgy, describing how, how certain metals, when heated, lose their shape, but when cooled, can amazingly recover their original form resiliently. And so we have come to understand resilience as being able to withstand or recover from difficult conditions, which make it a reactive skill, often in response to external dynamics. So that's a, that's a good metaphor. When, it, when it's really hot, it loses its form, and then when it's cooled, it's resilient enough to come back. A great, a great metaphor for people essentially losing their shape or their normal properties under hot or extreme conditions, needing to be, let's say, cooled off to gain some semblance of their former shape. In basic clinical terms, imagine the block U which is easy for us University of Utah supporters to, to imagine. Football fans display it all the time. Whenever they see a, you know, a TV camera, boom, this is what you get, the, the, block, the block U. So imagine this, got the block U, and the upper, the upper left corner represents kind of where, where we are situated in our daily lives, humming, humming blissfully along, never thinking for a moment we are up here. Never thinking for a moment, everything changes. And then the trauma occurs. It's referred to as disruption. It's a good term because indeed our regular happy lives are disrupted by something unthinkable, something we're not ready to handle. And so here we are, and what happens is we plummet. Okay. 
We're leading our lives to disruption, and we plummet. At the bottom of the block U, the bar that runs across, the bottom of the block U, you'll find the myriad interventions by professionals and by friends and family. This is the role we all need to fill. Because along the bottom part of the block U is where you find all the, all the hard work, the love and support to get a person cooler in order to resume the reshaping of his or her life. And when we're working along that, that bottom line of the block U, cliches are not very helpful. God needs another angel in heaven, will not restore resilience. I honestly have heard someone say, you know, I lost my husband about six months ago. Yeah, it, it takes a little while, you'll be, you'll be okay. This does not help resilience. We're talking about people who were riding the wave just fine and got knocked off by an unforeseen storm. They need the time to regain their bearings, to muddle, muddle through some of their, their core beliefs about life, to be loved for who they are, and ultimately some time and work to reframe their personal narrative that shapes their view of the world and themselves. So this side, right side of the block U, excuse me, that's the left side of the block U, represents the path of accepting a new normal. So we go from leading our lives, to disruption, working on moving things around, turning things around, and then we pursue the new normal. Resilience is not about regaining your old form, but really about learning how to deal with the new normal. And getting to the top of the right side of the block U means mastering life's greatest challenge. Again, it is life's greatest challenge. You, you have worked the emotional muscle to be strong enough to carry on to, to take back joy and live with meaning and purpose. An important piece of that work is done within a community, a community such as ours. Moving, moving a person along the bottom of the block U until she or he is capable of making the turn and embracing life once again. It may, it may well be the most important work that we do as a community. The last line of Samuel Beckett's The Unnameable ends like this. You must go on. I can't go on. I will go on. So be it. May we close our service, turning our hymn books, please, to number 346.
May we keep faith with, with life. It's mystery, it's grace, it's beauty, and with the love that sustains us all. Amen. Thank you, thank you, choir. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Holly Stewart. Holly Stewart, thank you. David Owens, thank you. And David Zabriskie, thank you so very much. <laughs>